Our Savior proceeded on the way to Calvary, bearing upon his shoulders, according to the saying of Isaiah, his own government and principality, Isaiah 9, 6, which was none else than his cross, from whence he was to subject and govern the world, meriting thereby that his name should be exalted above all other names, <clears throat> and rescuing the human race from the tyrannical power of the demon over the sons of Adam, Colossians 2:15. The same Isaiah calls it the yoke and scepter of the oppressor and executor, who was imperiously exacting the tribute of the first guilt. In order to destroy this tyrant and break the scepter of his reign and the yoke of our servitude, Christ our Savior placed the cross upon his shoulders, namely upon that place where are born both the yoke of slavery and the scepter of royal power. He wished to intimate thereby that he despoiled the demon of this power and transferred it to his own shoulders, in order that thenceforward the captive children of Adam should recognize him for their legitimate lord and king. All mortals were to follow him in the way of the cross, Matthew 14:24, and learn that by this cross they were subjected to his power, John 12:32, and now become his vassals and servants bought by his own lifeblood, 1 Corinthians 4:20. But alas, the pity of our most ungrateful forgetfulness, that the Jews and ministers of the Passion should be ignorant of this mystery, hidden to the princes of this world, and that they should dare not touch the cross of the Savior, because they considered it the wood of ignominy and shame, was their own fault, and a very great one, yet not so great as our own. Since its mystery being already revealed to us, we spend our indignation only on the blindness of those who were persecuting our Lord and God. For if we blame them for being ignorant of what they ought to have known, how much should we blame ourselves, who knowing and confessing Christ the Redeemer, persecute and crucify him by our offenses? Hebrews 6.6 6. O my sweetest love Jesus, light of my intellect and glory of my soul, do not, O my Lord, trust in my sluggish torpidity to follow thee with my cross on the way. Take it upon thee to do me this favor. Draw me after thee to run after the fragrance of thy sweetest love, Canticles 1-3, of thy ineffable patience, of thy deepest humility, that I may desire for contempt and anguish and seek after participation in thy ignominy, insults, and sorrows. Let this be my portion and my inheritance in this mortal and oppressing life. Let this be my glory and my repose, and outside of the cross and its ignominy, I desire not to live or be consoled or to partake of any rest or enjoyment. As the Jews and all of that blind multitude avoided the touch of the cross of him who was so innocently sentenced to die upon it, he opened with it a passage and cleared for himself a way. His perfidious persecutors looked upon his glorious dishonor as a contagion, and they fled from its approach, though all the rest of the streets were full of shouting and clamoring people who crowded aside as the herald advanced proclaiming the sentence. The executioners, bare of all human compassion and kindness, dragged our Savior Jesus along with incredible cruelty and insults. Some of them jerked him forward by the ropes in order to accelerate his passage, while others pulled from behind in order to retard it. On account of this jerking and the weight of the cross, they caused him to sway to and fro and often to fall to the ground by the hard knocks he thus received on the rough stones, great wounds were opened, especially on the two knees, and they were widened at each repeated fall. The heavy cross also inflicted a wound on the shoulder on which it was carried. The unsteadiness caused the cross sometimes to knock against his sacred head, and sometimes the head against the cross. Thus the thorns of his cross crown penetrated deeper and wounded the parts which they had not yet reached. To these torments of the body, the ministers of evil added many insulting words and execrable affronts, ejecting their impure, their impure spittle and throwing the dirt of the pavement into his face so mercilessly that they blinded his, the eyes that looked upon them with such divine mercy. Thus they of their own account condemned themselves to the loss of the graces with which his very looks were fraught.
by the haste with which they dragged him by the haste which which they with which they dragged him along in their eagerness to see him die they did not allow him to catch his breath for his most innocent body having been in so few hours overwhelmed with such a storm of torments was so weakened and bruised that to all appearances he was ready to yield up life under his pains and sorrows from the house of pilate the sorrowful and stricken mother followed with the multitudes on the way of her divine son accompanied by saint john and the pious women as the surging crowds hindered her from getting very near to the lord she asked the eternal father to be permitted to stand at the foot of the cross of her blessed son and to see him die with her own eyes with the divine consent she ordered her holy angels to manage things in such a way as to make it possible for her to execute her wishes the holy angels obeyed her with great reverence and they speedily led the queen through some by street in order that she might meet her son thus it came that both of them met face to face in the sweetest recognition of each other and in mutual renewal of each other's interior sorrows yet they did not speak to one another nor would the fierce cruelty of the executioners have permitted such an intercourse but the most prudent mother adored her divine son and true god laden with the cross and interiorly besought him that since she could not relieve him of the weight of the cross and since she was not permitted to command her holy angels to lighten it he would inspire these ministers of cruelty to procure someone for his assistance this prayer was heard by the lord christ and so it happened that simon of cyrene was afterwards impressed to carry the cross with the lord matthew twenty seven thirty two the pharisees and the executioners were moved to this measure some of them out of natural compassion others for fear lest christ the author of life should lose his life by exhaustion before it could be taken from him on the cross beyond all human thought and estimation was the sorrow of the most sincere dove and virgin mother while she thus witnessed with her own eyes her son carrying the cross to mount calvary for she alone could fittingly know and love him according to his true worth it would have been impossible for her to live through this ordeal if the divine power had not strengthened her and preserved her life with bitterest sorrow she addressed the lord and spoke to him in her heart quote, my son and eternal god light of my eyes and life of my soul receive o lord the sacrifice of my not being able to relieve thee of the burden of the cross and carry it myself who am a daughter of adam for it is i who should die upon it in love of thee as thou now wishest to die in most ardent love of the human race O most loving mediator between guilt and justice how dost thou cherish mercy in the midst of so great injuries and such heinous offence O charity without measure or bonds which permit such torments and affronts in order to afford it a wider scope for its ardor and efficacy O infinite and sweetest love would that the hearts and the wills of men were all mine so that they could give no such thankless return for all that thou endurest oh who will speak to the hearts of the mortals to teach them what they owe to thee since thou hast paid so dearly for their salvation from ruin Unquote. other most prudent and exalted sentiments besides these were conceived by the great lady so that i cannot express them by words of mine as the evangelist tells us there were other women among the crowds who followed the Savior in bitter tears and lamentations. Luke 23:27. The <clears throat> Swedish Jesus, turning toward them, addressed them and said, quote, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not over me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the day shall come wherein they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that have not borne, and the paps that have not given suck. Then shall they then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall upon us, and to these things what shall be done oh, wait a minute, fall upon us, and to the hills cover us. For if in the green wood they do these things, what shall be done in the dry? Unquote. But these mysterious words of the Lord acknowledged the tears shed showing his 
appreciation of them. He approved of them in these women. He wished to teach us for what purpose our tears should be shed so that they may attain their end. These compassionate disciples of the Lord were at that time ignorant of the true reason for their tears, since they wept over his sufferings and injuries, and not over the cause of those sufferings, and therefore they merited to be instructed and admonished of the truth. It was as if the Savior had said to them, Weep over your sins and over the sins of your children, and attribute what I suffer to those sins. I suffer not for my sins, for I am guilty of none and it is not even possible that I be guilty of any. If I approve of your compassion for me as good and just, much more do I desire you to weep over your sins, for which I suffer, and by this manner of weeping you shall acquire for yourselves and your children the price of my blood and of my redemption, ignored by this blind people. For there shall come days, namely the days of universal judgment and chastisement, in which those shall be Hail fortunate who have not begotten children, and the foreknown shall call upon the mountains and the hills to shield them against my wrath. For if their sins, now only assumed by me, have such effects on me, who am innocent, what horrible punishments will they draw upon those who are so barren and without any fruits of grace and merits? As a reward for their tears and their compassion, these women were enlightened so as to understand this doctrine. In fulfillment of the prayerful wish of the Blessed Mother, the Pharisees and ministers were inspired with the resolve to engage some man to help Jesus, our Savior, in carrying the cross to Mount Calvary. At this juncture, Simon of Cyrene, the father of the disciples, and Alexander and Rufus, Mark fifteen twenty one, happened to come along. I didn't know that. He was called by this name because he was a native of Cyrene, a city of Libya, and had come to Jerusalem. <clears throat> this Simon was now forced by the Jews to carry the cross a part of the way. They themselves would not touch it, yea, would not even come near it, as being the instrument of punishment for one whom they held to be a notorious malefactor. By this pretended caution and avoidance of his cross, they sought to impress the people with a horror for Jesus. The Cyrenian took hold of the cross, and Jesus was able, was made to follow between the two thieves in order that they all might believe him to be a criminal and malefactor like to them. The virgin mother walked very closely behind Jesus, as she had desired, and asked from the Eternal Father. To his divine will, she so conformed herself in all the labors and torments of her son, that witnessing with her own eyes and partaking of all the sufferings of her son in her blessed soul and in her body, she never allowed any sentiment or wish to arise interiorly or exteriorly, which could be interpreted as regret for the sacrifice she had made in offering her son for the death of the cross and its sufferings. Her charity and love of men and her, her grace and holiness were so great that she vanquished all these movements of her human nature. <clears throat> I desire that the fruit of the obedience, oh, I'm sorry, instruction, which the great queen and lady gave me. I desire that the fruit of the obedience with which thou writest the history of my life shall be <clears throat> that thou become a true disciple of my most holy son and of myself. The main purpose of the exalted and venerable mysteries which are made known to thee and of the teachings which I so often repeat to thee is that thou deny and strip thyself, estranging thy heart from all affection to creatures, neither wishing to possess them nor accept them for other uses. By this precaution thou wilt overcome the impediments which the devil seek to place in the way of the dangerous softness of thy nature. I who know thee, thus advise and lead thee by the way of instruction and correction as thy mother and instructress. By the divine teaching, thou knowest the mysteries of the passion and death of Christ and the one true way of life, which is the cross. And thou knowest that not all who are called are chosen. Many there are who wish to follow Christ and very few who truly dispose themselves to imitate him. 
for as soon as they feel the sufferings of the cross, they cast it aside. Laborious, exhortation, laborious exertions are very painful and averse to human nature, according to the flesh, and the fruits of the Spirit are more hidden, and few guide themselves by the light. <clears throat> On this account, there are so many among mortals who, forgetful of the eternal truth, seek the flesh and the continual indulgence of its pleasures. They ardently seek honors and fly from injuries. They strive after riches, contemn poverty. They long after pleasure and dread mortification. All these are enemies of the cross of Christ, Philippians 3.18, and with dreadful aversion they fly from it deeming it sheer ignominy, just like those who crucify Christ the Lord. Another deceit has spread through the world. Many imagine that they are following Christ their master, though they neither suffer affliction nor engage in any exertion or labor. They are content with avoiding boldness and committing sins, and place all their perfection in a certain prudence or hollow self-love, which prevents them from denying anything to their will and from practicing any virtues at the cost of their flesh. They would easily escape this deception if they would consider that my son was not only the Redeemer, but their teacher, and that he left in this world the treasures of his redemption, not only as a remedy against its eternal ruin, but as a necessary medicine for the sickness of sin in human nature. No one knew so much as my son and Lord. No one could better understand the quality of love than the divine Lord, who was and is wisdom and charity itself, and no one was more able to fulfill all his wishes. 1 John 4.16 Nevertheless, although he well could do it, he chose not a life of softness and ease for the flesh, but one full of labors and pains, for he judged his instructions to be incomplete and insufficient to redeem man. If he failed how to teach he failed to teach them how to overcome the demon, the flesh, and their own self. He wished to inculcate that this magnificent victory is gained by the cross, by labors, penances, mortification and the acceptance of contempt all of which are the trademarks and evidence of true love and the special watchwords of the predestined now my daughter knowest the value of the holy cross and the honor which it confers upon ignominies and tribulations do thou embrace the cross and bear it with joy in imitation of my son and thy master matthew sixteen twenty four. In this mortal life, let thy glory be in tribulations, persecutions, Romans 5, 3, contempt, infirmities, poverty, humiliation, and in whatever is painful and averse to mortal flesh. And in order that in all thy exercises thou mayest imitate me and give me pleasure, I wish that thou seek no rest or consolation in any earthly thing. Thou must not dwell in thy thoughts, enlisting the compassion of other no. Thou must not dwell in thy thoughts upon what thou bearest, nor seek to relieve thyself by enlisting the compassion of others. Much, much, much less must thou make much of it, or try to impress others with the recital of the persecutions or molestations of creatures, nor should it ever be heard from thy lips how much thou endurest, nor shouldest thou compare thy sufferings with those of others. I do not wish to say that it is a sin to accept of some reasonable and moderate alleviation or to mention thy afflictions, but in thee, my dearest, much alleviation, if not a sin, would be an infidelity to thy spouse and Lord, for he has put thee personally under more obligation than many generations of man, and thy response in suffering and love will be defective and wanting if it is not complete and loyal in all respects. So faithful does the Lord wish thy to correspond so faithful does the Lord wish thy correspondence to be, that thou must allow thy weak nature not even one sigh 
for mere natural relief and consolation, if love alone by its sweet force and rest in it alone, oh, if love alone impels thee, thou wilt allow thyself to be carried along by its sweet force and rest in it alone, and the love of the cross would immediately dispense with such natural relief in the same way as thou knowest I have done in my total self-sacrifice. Let this be to thee a general rule, that all human consolation is an imperfection and a danger, and that thou shouldest welcome only that which my most which the most high sends to thee himself or through his angels. And even these favors of the divine right hand thou must accept only in so far as they strengthen thee to suffer more constantly and to withdraw thee from all that ministers to the senses. Wow. I'm going to stop there for tonight. Blessed be our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our champion, our hero. May the Lord bless and keep you.